have a short amount of time to talk to you, but we wanted to kind of talk a little bit about conducting quality um, interventions in the AIS setting. And one of the things that you're going to hear today throughout this afternoon, I, hopefully you heard a little bit of that this morning, you're going to hear more of it this afternoon, is really it's all about reaching every kid and how do you do that, how do you differentiate, how do you make that work. So we're going to talk a little bit today about kind of what you're looking for. We're going to go through that really quickly. We're going to give you a chance to experience as a student what it would be like to take a quick assessment. Um, we're going to show you how quick it is for the teachers to actually be able to run reports on that. And then we're going to give you a chance to kind of view at some of the tools we have. And one thing you're going to hear me say, which you probably won't hear from a lot of other vendors, is we are a tool in a toolbox. I think we're a really great tool. I wouldn't have left what I was doing, which is what you guys are all doing, um, to do this if I didn't think we could help more kids. And that's what I'm very, very passionate about. But we are one tool in the toolbox. Don't ever think that there's going to be a magic bullet, one thing that's going to come in and now everything is better. But I think we're a very effective tool to help with that. So let's talk a little bit about it. I am a big, huge proponent of best practice. You hear that. If you've been in education, I bet you, if I asked you how many times have you heard the term best practice, probably you could say, how many people think they've heard it at least over 20 times in their career best practice? Okay, I kind of want to shoot people that say best practice because best practice always means that there's this attainable goal that this is the best thing that you can do and that there's a best practice that's going to fit every district, every kid, every school. It's not possible. What we know is there are best practices out there. And you can learn those and take from that research to make what I call your next practice. And I think you should constantly be refining what you're doing for that next practice. Um, teachers, Administrators, you all know there's always something new coming down the pipeline. That can be a really bad thing if we're thinking about it in terms of what's our next step along that continuum to help reach more kids. How are we changing? How are we morphing? The outside world is morphing. You're going to hear me talk about that this afternoon at a very fast rate. School is not morphing at that same rate. We've got to learn to bridge that gap between what's happening for the kids in the world and what's happening in our schools today and make that more relevant for them. So we're going to talk about next practice. So we're going to talk a little bit really quickly about what does research say are the next practices we could be looking at. We're going to talk about what tools are available to help obtain those next practice steps for you. And then the last thing we're going to do is what are some tips and strategies for modifying current, current practices or if you're starting a brand new AIS program, which there are a large number of uh, districts in the state of New York that are having to do that because AIS looks very different than it did because we have a whole lot more kids that are qualifying for AIS. And we have to start talking about how do we have conversations with kids, how do we have conversations with parents, how do we have conversations with our staff, how do we have conversations with our board. All of those things are what we're going to talk about this afternoon, so I'm not trying to go into that too much, but we're going to talk briefly about that today. So this was a quote that actually took place. We have, I'm a big proponent in student feedback. If you're not getting feedback from your students, you don't know what's going on in your schools. And when we're getting that feedback from students, often we get it from those kids that are the best. They're the ones that want to participate. They're the ones that are on our student council. Those are the ones that are like, the parents are really active, so they know how to advocate for themselves. But how do we get feedback from all of our students? And this is a quote that came out of a teacher who was collecting that kind of feedback from a struggling student. And this was literally what the student said. You know, it's that whole thing of, please don't give up on me. Just because I'm not there doesn't mean I'm not going to get there. And I get very disheartened sometimes when you're talking to educators. I was talking to one the other day who was saying to me, well, this student's in AIS, but in eighth grade when they're in AIS, and I'm saying, this is a seventh grade student, I'm saying, well, how do you know they're going to be in AIS in eighth grade? Well, let's be honest. Well, okay, let's be honest. If our AIS is going to be effective, the goal is maybe not within one year, but we shouldn't have kids that are staying in our system for five years and they're still in AIS. If they are, we need to look at what's going to be our next practice because we have to change things up. Had a great quote this morning um, from Mark on, if you do what you've always done, you're going to get the same results you've always gotten. We have to start thinking differently. So what must be effective, what must be present for good small group instruction? Let's just talk about that because really what it comes down to is AIS is really looking at hitting every, the needs of all of our students. And when we're talking about that, small group instruction is one of those tools we're going to get there and we're going to talk about different models at the end. The first one is be intentional. I have heard so many people when I'm talking to them, well, my AIS in my district is and I'm just going to throw out a product name. It's a great product. It's not our product. I'm still going to throw it out. Read 180. Great product. It does a very good thing for certain groups of kids that are struggling with certain things. But every student that's a level one doesn't just automatically go into Read 180. That may not even be their concern. How are we looking at what that student needs and not just saying Read 180 is our uh, service plan? You know, just right path is going to be our service plan. We've got to talk about this. 
be data driven. We need to be looking at what each individual kid's needs and we need to make that easy for teachers to do. If you can't make that easy for your teachers to do and they have to spend hours analyzing that, then we've already lost all that time for planning, which is really ultimately what we're trying to get to. Be collaborative. You heard it upstairs. You're going to hear it again and again. We can't all do this as islands. We can't do this as your individual district on your own, talking to other people, hearing other things that are going on there. Um, one of the goals that I really have as somebody who's working in this is to help bridge. What do I hear that's going on great in another district that I can help share with another district? Because a lot of times you don't have time to even talk about what's working. But we've got to be collaborative at every level. And be organized. And this is my favorite one. <laughs> we have to be flexible. We cannot say, here is our school improvement plan, we write it on July 1st, and we end it on June 1st, and then we say, okay, let's write another yearly plan. It has to be something we're constantly revisiting, see what's working, see what's not working, and tweak it. So, and the most important of all of this is if your small group instruction or if your AIS program, if what you're doing for your kids is not differentiated, forget about it. And there's lots of different ways to get there. I've had a lot of districts telling me I've got a big group of kids now that are in my AIS. Anybody not have a big group of kids in their AIS <laughs> this year? Probably not, right? So you have these big groups of kids in your AIS. How do you get all those good things in small group instruction if it has to be whole group? Well, you have to use tools to get there. We're going to talk about that. So differentiation. Differentiation is always um, talked about. And a lot of times with educators, we think of differentiation as this what the students need to learn that's different. And that is very true. That is a component piece of differentiation. We have to look at some students need to learn this, other students have mastered that, other students have this weakness. How do we bring all of that together? Well, we have to use tools to get there. But differentiation also includes how they're going to learn it. If you, I um, had a teacher who has uh, watched her when I was principal. She had the most fantastic lesson. One of those ones that, you know, they have, they have the laminated and it's the one they like to do every year when you come in to observe them kind of lesson. Fantastic lesson. Great. Reached 90% of her kids. She showed me her assessment data in her post-conference. I'm so excited for her. And I said to her, what are you going to do about these other 10% of the kids? And she said, well, that's the best way I knew how to teach it. These 10% of kids didn't get it. Okay, so let's go talk to Ms. Smith across, this, uh, across the thing and see how she did it. Maybe she reached her kids in a different way. Sometimes how the path they're going to get there, it could be a different amount of time it's going to take that student. It could be a different type of delivery. Um, it could be flipping it. Um, all of these different things need to be thought about. And the last one we need to think about is how are they going to show what they've learned for us? Some kids have to, we have to get them to the path of being able to show it the way we're going to be expected to at the state level eventually. We all know we have to meet that widget. But at the same time, kids can tell us and show us what they're learning in different ways to get there. Okay? And this is going to increase that efficiency and effectiveness for kids. It really will when we think about all three of these things. So, a few more things about AIS next practice. First of all, obviously you guys know this, if they're in AIS, they're, we need to be reinforcing something that was probably already taught to them. So one of the things we need to be doing is analyzing how was that taught to them. Let's see what resources we have as a district. That's where we're looking at things like the ID chart and saying, okay, if all of our sixth graders, if the largest area of deficiency in our school was this last year, okay, what did we do in the area of patterns in fourth grade math? Maybe we have really great textbook series we love, but for whatever reason, our kids didn't master that. So we need to look at that tool and see, okay, if that didn't work, we're gonna have to reinforce that in a different way this year. We have to increase instructional time for specific targeted skills. Most of our kids that are in AIS, a large number of them are students with um, special needs. They may be students with IEPs. They may be students who are just struggling lower learners. A lot of time that's a processing issue. A lot of time that means time on task. How are we going to get that for them? How are we going to get them additional time? We're going to talk about ways to structure that. Goal centered. One of the biggest things we know with AIS instruction is kids need to know what are my goals and how can I get there? What are my weaknesses? And I, you need to make it personal for them. Use those individual learning plans to meet with students and say, here's what we're going to be working on together because here's what you still need to master. And when you can communicate that with kids and they can start to share that and understand that's why I'm here and it's not just, okay, I have this in this you know, class just because. I'm here because I know I'm working on this and I know I can be effective at this after I get done. 
And then we need to provide our kids with an environment which they feel comfortable to ask questions, thoughts, and ideas. A lot of times our struggling learners are not going to be those kids that want to raise their hand and ask for help. They don't want to show that in front of other kids. And that's where all different types of tools can come into play, but the ability to use uh, threads and forums like we have through the system. The ability to use some of the things we saw there with the Flip Classroom Network where you just say three words out and it's, you know, that independent thought process to get a feel of the kids that are struggling in the class. Whether it's very informal surveys that are given to kids and there's so many survey tools out there um, to talk about that you can really get effective feedback and kids don't feel like it's not going to be used, like it's not about the teacher, I'm not evaluating the teacher, but I need to be able to give good feedback or I need to be able to ask those questions. How do we make that comfortable for our kids? And once again, we've got to ask them. And then we've got to provide them with additional corrective feedback. So another thing with our AS program is whatever we're using is how are we going to be reporting that progress. So if I have this goal and I'm the student and I know what my goal is, how am I going to know if I'm on track? How am I going to know along the way that I'm doing better? Because a lot of times our struggling learners just say, I'm bad at math. I'm not very good at reading. Well, that's very often not just the simple broad stroke we want to use. We really want to break that down. Right now, you're not good at fractions. Let's help you get better at that. Break that down and give them feedback on how they're performing along the way. Like I mentioned at the beginning, it's tools in a toolbox. And those tools are not only going to be the things you use, the curriculum you use, the assessments that you use, but also the delivery systems, all of these things are different tools and we need to be meeting as teams, we need to be talking about our AS programs, we need to be meeting and saying, okay, is this working, is this not working, what's not working, how do we change this, how do we make it your own? Um, and once again, we try to believe in that base of, we bring you a base and you can change that base and make it whatever you want in your district. Every single lesson, every single everything that we offer, you can make it your own. You can take it, copy it, make it your own, take things off, add things, whatever you want to do. Last but not least, and this is what goes back to that beginning piece we talked about, AIS instruction should not just be students in level one, therefore this is what they're going to do no matter what. It should be data driven. And that means looking at state assessment results and saying where were their deficiencies. If they're going and read 180 or another program, whatever that is, what is that program targeted for best practice to do? And is that program going to make a difference? Because if their deficiencies are in a completely different area, a lot of times our kids that are in um, AIS for reading, for instance, they may not have a fluency issue. It may not be a decoding issue at all. It's a comprehension, high-level critical analysis issue. issue. Um, this afternoon, we're going to talk about how many standards are now at the high level of Blooms versus the old, and it is astounding the percentage differences between what was and what is now. And when you look at that, that doesn't always mean that a kid Look at the increase we had. Did all of our kids become bad readers over the summer? Did they all go from being able to be level threes or fours down to twos just because? No, there was a change in expectations. And why was that change in expectation there and having those conversations? And that shouldn't be your end point. This should be your starting point because you have to use multiple measures. You have to keep using multiple measures to keep looking back and saying, are we making progress? Because this is only one way we should be assessed. And I think from there we're going to use those learning plans, we're going to use a small group, and we're going to kind of go in now and start looking at the tools that you have available, and Crystal's going to walk you through a little bit of that experience of being that student in that AIS classroom, and then we're going to come back together and talk about models. A couple of little things before I jump in, I guess I have to use this. <laughs> um, there's a couple of other things that I want to just go through that to kind of reiterate what Emily was going through. Um, when we're planning for AIS instruction, very first thing, be explicit. If they know exactly what they're going to learn, it's paramount. The next is to model the instructional tasks. Again, we can't just say, okay, we're going to learn about fractions today. We have to show them some think aloud, some different strategies that they can use to really make it concrete for them. The next is the big point, and again, she hit on this earlier. Um, there's all sorts of different things that we can do for mandatory engagement. We have the fancy clicker things, the response systems, but I remember I had um, page protectors and I would put construction paper in there and write and they become little cheap mini dry erase boards and everything. You can get really creative, but especially for our AIS population, they have to get a little bit of a different way of instruction normally. So trying to keep them engaged is really critical and that's another important part of what we're going to go through today. 
Next is multiple opportunities. Um, in our system, we labeled here guided practice and independent practice. We don't want to just say, okay, here's one problem for you. I'm going to assess whether or not you master this. We want to give them multiple opportunities in order to show what they know, both with feedback and without feedback. And again, we have the feedback here. It's critical. We can't stress that enough. Sometimes we just say, you got it correct. You have your paper. I remember that in school myself. When you got your paper back, you got the 80% on it. I don't really know why I got an 80% on it. If I got some feedback, maybe I could boost myself up. And last, we need to make sure that at the end result, they're completing their activities at the highest level. There's building blocks along the way. We know that. But at the end result is that highest level that we want them to achieve. For us, we know we never want to, I, I think of it like a parallel bar, because I love gymnastics. I could never be a gymnast, though. But the parallel bar, you have your middle one and you have your high bar. If they only stayed at the middle bar, that's not great. They're never going to win an Olympic medal. It's a neat metaphor to kind of think about. You have to try and go the extra mile, and that's what we want for our kids. What we're going to do in just a few minutes is we're going to actually go into the system, and we're going to see some examples of assessments and lessons. What I really wanted to show here is the elementary lessons that we have in here, we refer to them as our intervention lessons if you've been in the system. Um, they've been specifically designed for standards. But if you look at this chart, the high school lessons really aren't that different. We're used to doing these small group type of ideas at the elementary level. It's common. At the high school level, as I'm sure Brian was talking about up there, they're starting to see that this model is effective, and I'm sorry. Um, but what I really wanted to show here is in our system, we have these different lessons. They can be used for the same purposes. And that's what we're going to get into at the end. So what I'm going to do now is actually get you into the system. Um, I'm going to show you first how to make an assessment. So Emily said that we were collecting data. So we're going to kind of pretend that we're in the beginning of the school year. We might have gotten our state data back, or we might have given a benchmark assessment. But now we have a couple of standards that we've assessed, or that we've taught, and we need to assess them. So what I'm going to do now is show how to do that. You're going to become the students and take an assessment, and we'll show you how everything ties together so you can really start making some important instructional decisions. As Crystal logs in, um, just to go back to that whole model, um, one of the things with uh, districts when we start talking about the difference between elementary and high school, we have very different platforms at the elementary and high school level. But the high school levels were specifically devised to cover the entire set of curriculum. That doesn't mean they don't make great AIS lessons because they absolutely do. Because some of the features Crystal's going to show you as we go into assigning and things, and if we were looking back at the chart, you'll see that those same components that are available in the intervention lesson are available in the high school lesson, and they're in there for a, a distinct purpose and reason. Because those are the good best practice that you're going to use in your next practice steps in order to get kids to learn. It really doesn't change kindergarten to high school. It's just the rigor level changes, the structure, and some of the expectations on things like extended uh, responses and essays and BBQs and things like that go up at the high school level. But the base is still the base. All right. Okay. So I'm going to try and go through this a little bit quick. I know we're getting close to lunch, and I'm sure everybody's bellies are growling, because mine is. <laughs> so, so as a preview, like I said, I'm going to show you how you can easily create an assessment. You already have one. So when you log in, and I'll explain how to do that, you're going to go through. The first thing we're going to do is make sure you take your assessment. And I'm going to preface this before we even log in. We don't want the 100%. I will tell you it's a second grade lesson our uh, assessment, and we purposely did that so you can see, like, you know, okay, one plus one, one isn't. Nobody's going to be taxed on their brain power Yes. Today, and you all have, you know, it's not like, you know, Linda got the 20%. We're not going to judge or anything. But just get them incorrect, because we want to show what it would look like. Not Yes. Yep. Right. Go to a different breakout <laughs> session now. You're out of here. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so from, I don't know if anybody has um, experienced creating an assessment before, but from the home page, you can click assessment creator. There's multiple ways to get into everything. But from here, we really tried to make it pretty streamlined. So just in a few steps, you can actually create an assessment, have your kids take it, you get your results, and you're starting to make some instructional decisions. And I'm going to let Crystal keep going for just a second. One thing just to note up here, you will notice you won't get Arizona when you log in. As a, as a yeah, this is our demo York. system. You'll only get your state. You will notice that there is New York and there is Common Core, and a lot of times the question will come up, well, why are there both? Isn't Common Core adopted by New York? We 
we have left the old standards in because of um, with the elementary even there's some great other standards that are base skills for common core standards but sometimes teachers like to go in and utilize that first and then go into common core so we've left them there as options and also all the high school assessments are still created from new york um, for the most part except for common core algebra would be the one exception to that rule because that's the one that's changed um, english will be so from here, your next step is to choose your content area in your grade. So I'm just going to choose sixth grade math. You guys are going to take second grade, not to scare you. <laughs> then your next step is to, actually, you know what? I'm going to go back. I meant to choose reading. Not yet. She's showing you the teacher side. Yep, I'm in as a teacher right now. So what I did is I changed my mind now, and I'm going to do an, um, a reading assessment right now. So this has an extra piece to it. That's why I want to show it to you. The first step is you can choose whether or not to have passages. So if you want the students to read passage, answer some questions, you can do that. So I'm going to say yes. And one of the neat features, the original way it was kind of like, you know, you choose your standards, I'm going to give you an assessment. This is really customizable. So the teachers can actually go in here and say, today I'm looking for a fiction story, and I want to preview it to make sure that this is exactly what my students should be receiving. They can preview it. They can see what standards are met by it. You can preview to make sure that this is exactly what they want. Is there a place to see the lexile level? You don't see the lexile level in here. All of the ones in the grade level are within that lexile band. Yeah, that grade. So we run that through. Common Core, common core band. Yeah. If you were in Common Core, you were in the Common Core band. Um, and this way, too, if they're doing a particular theme, they can look and see, is there anything that aligns to a theme I'm doing in my class? This is where the reading part comes. Okay, so I actually chose second grade in here, actually. So oh, this is a silly. No, I, I, I went like, to. Uh, that's a like, so <laughs> yeah, grade, right? I went to second grade. Um, this story is interesting if you ever want to look at it. It's not really. So in here, you can go ahead and you can choose all of the different questions up here. You can choose whatever questions you want, and the standards are uh, underneath each question. Right, yeah, I was going to just show it. So yep. As Crystal can show you here, the standards are underneath each question on the reading so that they can kind of see. And not every standard is going to be by every passage as you would expect because not every standard lends itself. Obviously you're going to have your RLs and your RIs are going to be easy to pick from fiction and nonfiction. Okay. So pretend that we chose math. This is kind of where the math would start. But at this point, if you're doing reading, you can choose to include non-passage questions. So those are going to be your language, your vocabulary, those kind of questions. And I'm going to say yes. And sometimes those are standards that are covered in passages, but you could also choose standalone questions from them as well. So you'll see a lot of times we'll get a question from teachers when they first use Okay, so again, you can come in here and select your standards that you want. And then your next step is to come in here and do a question count. What we really stress, especially for those little formative quick checks, um, you have the ability to do up to 25 questions per standard, but if it's a quick check, the 25 questions per these two standards will take them all day. So, and it's really just meant to see how are they doing. So just five to 10 questions normally is what we recommend. So I'm just gonna do two questions for right now. You hit next, and here again you see your preview of questions. The neat part about here is you can have a bunch of different options. You can delete the question, you just say, eh, I didn't really want to have five questions, I can delete it off. I can refresh it to have another question from the bank of questions automatically appear, or this is what I would do if I was doing this because I'm picky. I can come in here and see all of the questions that are tied to this standard, and I can say, bam, question 61 is the one I want. I'm going to put it in here, and it's there. And again, you can see the standard underneath there. Then your next step, it's pretty simple. Your next step is to give it a bunch of information. So these can be taken online, which is really neat, and that's the part that we're going to go into next. A whole bunch of reports that you can have instantly, pretty instantly. Um, you can also take it on paper. We really, for a lot of the parts of our system, we don't want to make it so if you don't have resources available to you to have the students come in and take it online, they can still do it paper and pencil. It takes a little bit of extra work, but you still can get your reports eventually. Yeah, it's a lot easier if you can to do it online. Um, the other neat part is you can assign it to multiple classes, specific students, or you can go ahead and say, I'm going to create a bunch of assessments that I'm going to assign to my kids later, but I want to have it in here. So all of that option is there. You hit next. It's automatically assigned to your kids. And a couple things for AIS specifically is I really stress this, specific students in the class, because a lot of times when we're talking AIS, everybody's not going to get the same assessment, because you might have been doing different things in this group than you were doing in this group. Every assessment may look a little different week to week. So that's one thing to note. The other thing to note is, 
any of your AIS classes. A lot of times if it's structured during the school day and it's a set AIS period, you'll be fine because you're going to have that in your system and you're going to have an AIS teacher. A lot of times though, some of these kids may be kids that we also qualify for after school tutoring, before school tutoring. We can make a grouping out of them using what we call ad hoc and then you can look at those kids' data together and group them together so you get any data you have on those kids regrouped in that grouping. So that teacher doesn't have to go say, okay, you have Johnny from reading, can I get his reading results from you and you and you and you and then put them all together and try to come up with their own small group that can do it inside the system. Would you should suggest that for teachers who are inclusion teachers as well? So absolutely. That they a teacher, the whole group mm -hmm. Absolutely. If they wanted to have their own targeted assessment for a group of students they're working with, they could totally have a regrouped ad hoc classmate and then that assessment could be different for that grouping than say the rest of the class at a given time even if needed. And the, the reports that you get would reflect, so if you had your five kids that you pulled out for that class, then you would see your results so you would get a small group report just for those kids so it wouldn't be the entire population of that class. And whenever you're using ad hoc, we typically give that permission to a person in a building or one person in the district to build those. Um, it's very, very simple. So now that's been assessed out or assigned out. So now you get to pretend to be second graders. So on each of your computers, there's a card that says student and a number. That's going to be your username. Your password is going to be password. So we're going to log in and you're actually going to take an assessment that we assigned to you. Again, try to get some questions wrong. I know you're going to be the, the brown noser and try to go for the hundred, but. Maybe we should give Linda the jump to try to get none wrong. <laughs> So if you have any trouble logging in, just let one of us know. Once you're in, it's going to look a little bit different because I was actually, I was even more of a brown noser and I did this before class started. So I took an assessment she already. <laughs> I did. So up here, once you get in, it's going to say AIS se session one up in your assignments and you're going to have four new actually up there. One of them is called AIS math assessment session one, something like that. If you click on that, so if you clicked on for new and then clicked on that on the drop down, that's going to open up your assessment. So this is exactly what the students see. So you can actually go through, and I'm just going to make sure. You are taking the math assessment. So we're good. Oh, and I'm sorry, your password is session one. This is another feature, so that way you can have them assigned. You don't have them going through and taking it before you want them to. So you can have the password in there. So that's the neat thing with AIS is a lot of times talking about increasing that instructional time when we talk about flipped classrooms, we heard one way to do that was video. It's going to talk a lot, or if you go to the other session after lunch. No, the number one. Creative classroom. One of the ways to really flip the classroom is to actually consider some of the Oh, okay. You're good. Coming into class to You're good. Get instruction. So, but the ability to password protect your assessment would keep them from being able to log in at home and take that assessment in advance of being in class because you may not want mom to be helping with, you know, an assessment. Mom not that probably mom not. and dads ever mom help with help. assessments, but. I know it's shocking, mom right? No. Shocking. Okay, so once you get that open, you can go through, answer the questions. At the very end, it'll ask you to submit the assessment. And when you're all done, and I'm not going to make you put your hand on your head or something like I used to do with the kids, but just look up front and then we'll show you what we can do after that. And if you're really speedy, we do have a couple of other lessons in there. If you wanted to preview, we have some high school ones, another second grade intervention lesson, and um, an eighth grade one, I believe. So we'll give you a couple of minutes. Hopefully the questions won't be too tricky. level or higher of a standard for it not to show up for proficiency. Meaning, if you have an assessment that has three questions on a standard on it, kids are going to have to get two, they're going to have to get all three of those correct actually to not have that show up on their learning plan. When you get to four questions, they have to get at least three of the four correct to get to proficiency level. So think about it from that aspect. It's very easy to get a quick check with limited targeted questions. 
I was going to go and spy on them, but I probably won't. Okay. <laughs> and as Crystal mentioned, if you finish, we did load some uh, lessons in there, so you can skip these if you're more interested in their school. To get back to it, you can just click on the home page, and you'll go back to that main page and just click on the, should say three new now once you did that. You got a tricky one? A tricky one? <laughs> So a couple of different things. First of all, remember we talked about tools in the toolbox. Yes. So if we have pushback on this, this is a tool in the toolbox. Here's a great way to use that tool. It doesn't have to be just kids on a computer. What we can do, especially in those primary grades, and we see this a lot, is I can project a lesson up for a small group. And as I have that lesson projected up, and I can show you really easily, I'll jump in real quick and then go on, add, add offline here real quick. But as I go in here and I pull up a lesson, actually come in here under view results results and pull up any lesson what we call student view mode. This makes a great projectable lesson where I could be sitting with a small group of kids, four or five, especially at the primary levels. We're always functioning in circles. So a center group might be coming back to me. I can project this up and work with them on it and they can have little whiteboards in front of them. And as we get to a question, they're answering it on their whiteboard and I'm looking real quick and doing a scan of who's got it now and who's still got to go because what I could do is I could actually play a lot of our lessons, have a video or something in it, I might play that for them. I might be adding color to this as a teacher. And honestly, we see this all the way through the high school model. A lot of our high school teachers um, use that kind of a model where they've got it projected up, they're kind of going through it, they're, they're adding their own color to it. You know, if you've got that smart board or whatever, you could be up here, you know, adding drawing, uh, moving back something to show it again, moving forward, but then I can jump to you know, my skill builder questions or my independent question, uh, independent section questions, and I can have the kids say, okay, now everybody work on that one, and I'm scanning the room real quickly and doing that. That's a great workaround for it. The other thing that we do have coming in lessons, um, and we're working on prototypes of that now, and the first prototype will be coming out pretty soon, is the ability to do text-to-speech. And we're going to have it so it can be enabled or disabled depending on the students and who you're working with. But as we're adding some of those kinder and first grade pieces that are coming on this year, we're trying to make that more and more friendly where that can be turned on because some of the standards are with us with that with that extra assistance. The goal is not in first grade necessarily that the kids are able to, you know, read that in the math. It's really that they're able to solve that. So where that's appropriate, we could then have that ability inside of a question. But yeah, there's always going to be like I said, there's never one good way for every kid. Some kids can get on the computer and do this just fine independently. Other kids are going to need that teacher to help guide them. This tool gives them the ability to do both. I also see this. I mean, so many districts are using the Dana's rubric. Dana's rubric talks about being how to be effective if the kids aren't in the classroom. Yep. So I look at this as a small group in front of the smart board while a teacher is working with another group somewhere else. Right. And they almost have a built-in teacher at the, mm -hmm. at, the, at the board that the kids can actually Absolutely. And say, what do we think this is? Right. And then write it on the transparency on the smart board because you can put this on and have the transparent smart board above it. And then when they see if it's right or wrong, wow, it's them assessing themselves. Absolutely. So I see it even taking it to the next level. Absolutely. And then we talk about flipping the classroom. How about if we did a lesson, the kids were assigned the lesson, they're doing the lesson of the course. It, it doesn't even have to be flipped outside of the school day. Think of it as flipped even inside the school day, where you know, you're know you gonna go to a center at this time, and I, as the teacher, can now get on and see exactly how you did and say, okay, no, I gotta re re recapitulate this group a little bit, because I'm noticing it when they went on this, they still didn't do well. It's another tool in that toolbox. But it, there's many different ways to use it. I d never like to hear just, okay, every kid just gets on and just takes all the lessons. Or, that's not gonna solve the problem. It will help you, because it's targeted, and I do believe they're great lessons and great exemplars and things, but it's not going to solve the problem. We've got to think of it as a tool. But you're absolutely correct. Um, that would be a really exciting model to have 
a couple teachers in your district try out. And here's the thing, get a couple people really jazzed about it and it will spread like wildfire. It really does. The other neat part too is it's just another way of instructing too. So if you instructed about fractions in the classroom and you had a couple kids, they're just not getting it. Maybe the way that it's instructed on here or vice versa is going to have the aha moment. So there's a bunch of different ways to get creative with these things, but that's the whole thing. We have to get creative because what's status quo right now obviously isn't. And as we mentioned, the really cool part about this is they can change anything in the system. Mm -hmm. like the teacher really likes part of this, but does wants to present the learning component in a different way. Copy it and cut that part out. Add your own new part to it. They can totally do it. They've made their own flip video. They can embed that flip video here and have those questions and use that as a targeted way. As he was, Mark was up there this morning talking, I was thinking, you know, some of the great strategies he was talking about. Wow, the ability to use this inside that system because now it's archived, it's stored. It doesn't have to be the same thing you're doing every year, but you can go in and tweak it and adjust it yourself as you go through. Um, okay. I think Crystal's going to show you how we run reports. I'm going to get her back. Um, no, one of no, the things no. I do want to tell you too is when the teachers assign the lessons now too, if there's parts of the lesson, like if they, um, a really good example of this would be at the high school level. We have a lot of essay DB keys. A DBQ kind of components that are added into our extended response. Sometimes when you're in the AIS setting, you may or may not want that piece for that particular lesson. You can basically choose from the menu. It'll automatically default to assigning the whole lesson, but they can unclick anything they don't want the kids to have. So if it's just, you know, I want to do the independent practice section, the multiple choice, because I want a quick check, but I don't want the, to have the essay component this time, they can choose this flag and leave that off, and now it assigns the kids that way, and they don't have Okay, so what I want to show you now is you all took your second grade assessment. We're going to see how well you did. But it's pretty easy just to get your reports. I'm, I'm really curious to see. What student number are you, two? I think you're, I laid him out, and I know he's one, so you have to be two. <laughs> so, what, so what you would do is you come into your assignments. So these are all of the assignments that your kids have gotten. So I'm going to choose our session one here. And since you all completed it, that's where it's going to be. So I have it down here. So what I'm going to do now is it tells me up here that you have started it, so I can't make any changes to it. What I can do is I can actually come in here, and if I really wanted to see what student two did, she got the zero. Good job. I think when we when we get up there, you have to get the raffle tickets. This is the first time you've ever been given positive reinforcement for getting a zero. I guarantee it. <laughs> So you can come in here, you can actually see what each student answered. But the really neat part is we can actually run data center reports. So if you've seen any of our other reports for our benchmarking, I know some districts have been using that. Um, we can actually run them. So you hit this button, it tells you that it's going to automatically take all of that data and make reports out of it. There's two ways you can get to it. You can either come in here to the reports and you can click on the different things. But I'm actually going to go into the data center to show you where this will be. So when I come in here, I'm going to go into our class. And right up here, I have my assessment creator reports, which is where we created this assessment. And I can actually come in here and say, all right, I'm going to run a small group plan for my group of 10 people who took this. I'm going to run it. Now, if you all did too poorly, we is it, yeah, there's not going to be. be <laughs> so we'll see how we do on that. I know, there were some overachievers over there getting seven. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> I saw that. So when we come in here, we can select our assessment. And you can see pretty quickly once this really, I'm going to run our whole group plan so then. That's an important thing for your teachers to know. Everything turns into a whole group, a small group. Every standard on your assessment. If everything's on your whole group, that means you have, and you may start out with that in AIS. If you're doing AIS pre-assessment, you're probably going to have a lot of whole group, not a lot of small group. That's going to happen. As you've taught something, you should see a lot of small group and not as much whole group. So when we asked you to vomit out, we did a good job. We all vomit out the standards pretty well. Because like I said, you have to get to that 70% mastery level. Another concern for teachers is, you know, if they get a question right on it, does that mean that they're going to show mastery? Well, not if they're, if you put two or three questions on there. They're going to have to get all three of those right to show mastery. It's not until you get to four and above where, you know, you can miss one and be okay. And that's okay. It's okay. And if you ever have to dig back deep, you can go back in and make another quick check assessment. This is how fast it can be done. We the other cool thing is, as Crystal shows you, she ran that. Let's say somebody else just walked in, went back there and took it. You can rerun the data, and it's going to recapitulate everything again and show you what that new student added to it. So you don't have to wait 
for your kids to all finish it, but you can re keep rewriting it until you have everybody in. What I was going to say in addition to um, the mastery of the standards, and we'd rather it appear up here than to say, okay, well, they got the one question correct, so we don't need to remediate on that at all. So that's why you'll see some of that up there. The main ones you're going to look at for AIS purposes are going to be your small group and your learning plans. We do have a couple of other ones in here so you can see the rank order, the rank order and all of that. But really, ultimately, you want to see what each of your students or your small groups of students have done. So you can come in here and we can see that for every student. And I'm sorry, Chris, you're going to be the first one up here. This is your learning plan. Guess what? You need to work on both of the standards that were on this assessment. Yeah, we only have two standards on there. <laughs> but you can come. They are. You could have gotten kids who could skip count forward without a problem, but backwards is definitely an issue. So I would definitely on this this assessment absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a, Linda brings up a great point. So two different ways to handle that: the item analysis. That's why we kept it in there. We don't want teachers to have to spend hours going through an item analysis to see if a standard belongs somewhere or not. But if we do do a spread, some of our standards in Common Core are very broad. You can make two choices. One is using that choose. So if I just want to be able to skip counting, counting forward, I could have gone through that bank and said, no, I'm only going to take this one, this one, and this one, because that's what I want to assess this time. So even though that's going to show up on my learning plan, if I know all my questions are on that, then I'll know. When you have a mixed one where you have two different questions like that, the item analysis is also there because I can go in and say, OK, it was question number two. So it wasn't forward counting. It was you know counting right. backwards. So when you do your first year year assessment, you're going to end up with more Exactly. Absolutely, and that should that's to be expected for if those you're assessments. Using that for it's for APCR purposes, and you take that beginning of your benchmark. A lot of times, you're going to get feedback from the teacher. I don't have a small group plan. Right. Well, if the beginning of the if the yeah, beginning of the year test or the end of the year standards, chances are there aren't going to be a lot of standards where a majority of the class has shown mastery. Now, interestingly enough, Riverhead. I'll talk to Riverhead and Dave Wicks. When we first started doing benchmarking with them, one of the things that was a big shocker for their third grade teachers was. Every, and I did data analysis team training with every single one of their grade levels that first year as they were getting to off the ground. And every single group we met with in third grade, beginning of the year test, they took it, I think, the second week in school, Dave, I want to say it was something like that. Every single one, they found that the only, the standard of symmetry was um, always a small group skill. All their kids had mastered it. They said, we usually spent a week teaching that. And they realized the second grade had done such a great job with it, it fell off the plate. Now, First year common core, probably not a lot that's going to fall off that plate. But as we start seeing this and as we start moving to these next practices that get our kids to mastery, we're going to start finding those things that help us streamline and condense the curriculum even further. That's a great point. Okay. So then there are a couple of other reports that you can run, but you can kind of see how pretty quickly you can assess, you can have them do the assessment, and then you can get some really powerful information. So this is Really, what Emily was saying about next practices, it used to be kind of a guessing game. You just said, okay, well, you're not so great at fractions, but maybe it is a different type of question like you were saying. Maybe it's just that the opposite kind of question that they just don't have enough exposure to. They need to see some modeling of it. But it's really going in, and, and it's powerful information that can really start to impact these kids and to ultimately move them out of AIS because that's the ultimate goal. Let's say you have Unidil has been doing, and you really, yeah, Unidil would be a great person to talk to. They started doing it. They did a two-day session PD this summer, and their teachers have started to build their own banks. They're adding to what we have, and they're also building their own. So you have that capability within the system to do that as well. Um, the one, the one, I'll just throw it out there now. The one thing that comes up a lot is the extended response. We don't typically, we don't do that in the assessment creator yet because of that ability to run instant reports. But we are exploring some options for how moving forward we might be able to utilize that this piece to do those so you can still do those through lessons but you can't do them through in a quick as check assessment but it's a great thing too so if you get feedback from your teachers i love what they have but i'd love to have more well first of all let us know that because we're constantly revising and building what we have but the second thing is let, let each of your teachers know too we can turn on the ability for them to add questions to the bank and you can see which ones are just created by your district versus us so i know i see people heading toward lunch <laughs> so we'll get you out on time Real quickly, we wanted to talk about effective models. We've seen it all. If you want to talk to us or if you want to know districts that have done different things, you can talk to me later during lunch, after lunch, at the end of the day. I'll stay as late as you want or email me. But some of the most effective models we've seen. 
um, whole group, small group. This is that traditional structure that you think of where you have that, we'll just say 60 minute period, it doesn't really matter what you're talking about, where a portion of the AIS program is whole group instruction. What do most of the kids in this class need? What are on those whole group learning plans? We're going to all do that together. That could be that smart board projector if you're using our tool. It could be another tool, whatever that is, that whole group instruction model. Then a second part of that period is broken up into small group pullback. And that's where we start getting into stations. These kids might be doing an independent lesson on the computer. Another group might be working with the teacher. And then they're going to work on another group might be working on an assessment because they worked with the teacher the day before in AIS. And now they're getting their quick check assessment to see what we need to assign to them. So you can see how that can play out. It's been a very effective model in districts a lot of times. This one is one that I have not seen as much. I'll be honest with you, I have a lot of experience. We did this inside the school where I was principal. We found a lot of success with it. I think you're going to see more New York State uh, districts moving to this because of the number of kids in um, AIS, and it's called the flexible whole group. Basically, what does that mean? Well, it means I might be with this class this day, but that might be switching because I don't have all these little nice, beautiful small groups pulled out. And I might have the ability within my school day to say, you know what, teacher X is really great at working on fractions and this. So when they're in that, they're going to go to this whole group class setting, and this group is going to get pulled out and go over here. And that can change and rotate. This requires a lot of coordination, a lot of planning. If you're just starting a model with AIS, probably not your first next practice but a great place to get to if you find this is a continual struggle where you have a lot of kids qualifying for the same areas. Okay. Yeah. We do. We have to, we have to get this group mentality going. It's not me versus you, us versus we've got to be collaborative. Remember, I mean, we're going to keep talking about, we'll talk about some conversations upstairs you can have with your staff to get them there. But yeah, APPR would be the, we've heard that come up a lot. Um, model three, the other one, um, this is what is more traditionally uh, relying a little more on the computer because the only way we get individual plans going <laughs> is if kids are assigned work online. It might be with us, it might be Read 180, it might be other tools you're using too, so I'm not saying it just has to be this. But it's the model where a lot of the kids might be working independently and teachers are continuously pulling back small groups to get that touch point. Um, I've seen both this and this be effective. I think it depends on where you are resource-wise, and it also depends on where you are on the continuum and where your, teacher, where your teacher's comfort level is going to be. Um, but all three of these have been very effective models, and if you want to hear more about any of them, we can definitely get you more information or try to set you up with somebody, or I can talk with you or your staff. So um, I think that being said, lunch was going to start, so I want to make sure you guys get food first. So we're going to go upstairs again. Up, lunch is going to actually be served upstairs in the room where we had the breakout. The food's going to be out there. Make yourselves plates. Enjoy. Feel free to talk to people. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to this afternoon. Okay? Thanks, everybody, for coming down.